For example, if we divide 1 by 1 minus x, we get the infinite power series from n is equal to 0 to an infinity of x to the n. And if you don't, if you don't, don't think that works, simply divide 1 by 1 minus x. And the, the trick here, by the way, just, just while we do it, is to add and subtract x, and later add and subtract x squared, and later add and subtract x cubed, and so on. So that's the trick in doing that, but um, that's that's for another day's work. Next, where f of x is infinitely differentiable, and also a few other things like smoothness and continuity and whatnot, we were able to extend the concept of power series representing functions to Taylor series and also Maclaurin series. So the Taylor series of a function is written here. Now that's something you can see in thermodynamics video 15 if you like, uh, or you can see my thermodynamics video, so there's no big deal there. So for example, if you want to see the, the um, Maclaurin expansion of cosine of x, look at thermodynamics 15 and you find this particular expression. The point is we can use power series in order to represent a function at a particular point. But Taylor and Maclaurin power series expansions or approximations are only local. How do we possibly extend this to approximate a function globally? Well, Joseph Fourier proposed and Peter, well, I'm not gonna try this, this name, we'll say this man <laughs> showed that an infinite series of cosines and sines is able to represent a function globally. So it's something similar to a power series. My point here is that if you can accept that, if, that a power series can approximate your function locally, then you should have no particular problem in accepting that this Fourier series can approximate your function globally. Let's talk a bit more about basis functions. We usually represent arbitrary points in space using vectors. The vectors we use are i hat, j hat, k hat, and these are known as the basis vectors for your space. So because it's easier to draw in two dimensions, let's draw in two dimensions here. And we see that any point can be written or is a i hat plus b j hat. And I've written the usual properties of, of the basis vectors here. Now, the, the thing here is that in order to represent a single point in space, in say 2D space, we only require two basis vectors. However, we require an infinite number of basis functions. So let's say we pick cosine and sine, well the cos of naught is one and the sine of naught is naught. So we get one plus cos one t and sine two t, sine, sine t. We have cos two t and sine two t, cos three t and sine three t and so on up to infinity. And that is how we would represent a point in space using these basis functions. It only requires two basis vectors in, in 2D space, but it requires an infinite number of basis functions. And you might say, well, why, would, why is this, why would we bother making it so complicated? Well, like I've said in the past, it's because it allows us to get access to the frequency components of our signal. And it also allows us to later actually manipulate very complicated mathematical expressions in a manner which is unavailable using the normal basis vectors. So how do I convince you that this is the case? How do I convince you that in fact we can represent functions using cosines and sines? So I'm gonna try and convince or remind you. Let's say we want to represent a square wave. We start off with a single sine wave here, so sine, sine one times x. And we see that here we've signed 3x, we're after increasing the frequency. Now what if I start adding different signs of different frequencies? So I have the sign of 1 times x, 3 times x, 5 times x, 7 times x. And we get something which is starting to look like a square wave. Nonetheless, it is not a square wave. But we start adding up more and more frequencies. So adding up all the odd numbers between 1 and 15 here. All the odd numbers between 1 and 23 here all the odd numbers between 1 and 31 here. Now before I go to the final one, I'd just like to point out that this thing here is called a Gibbs overshoot. 
It means that discontinuities are very difficult to represent using Fourier series and require an infinite number of terms, but that's something is not it's not really for this this time. So finally, if we add up all the terms between 1 and 39, uh, all the odd number terms between 1 and 39, we get pretty much a perfect square wave. Now, I know what that it is not perfect square wave because we have we have these areas here, but if we plotted an infinite number of terms, we would get a perfect square wave. The point is, adding up an infinite number of cosines and sines is in fact well able to represent functions. So in this particular case, in the limit, sine x plus one third three x plus one, one fifth sine five x plus one seventh sine seven x is able to represent f of x. And in the limit it goes to f of x is equal to one on minus f from zero to pi and minus one from minus pi to two pi. So this is in fact a two pi periodic function. At this point, you might well be saying to yourself, well, hold up a second. Why am I spending so much time working on the Fourier series? Surely it's the Fourier transform that we are here to learn about. Well, the answer is that the Fourier transform extends the concept of the Fourier series. The limits are extended from zero as the lower limit to minus infinity, so that the Fourier transform goes from minus to positive infinity. And the Fourier transform allows us to go from discrete functions to continuous functions. So in many ways, the Fourier transform is the continuous analog of the Fourier series. Not quite, but that is in fact a good rule of thumb. And shortly enough, we will see how starting with the definition of the Fourier series, we come to the derivation and we work through the derivation and come to the expression for the Fourier transform. Where do we go from here? I would now like to discuss with you how we would derive the Fourier transform. And I mean this roughly because I will perform a rigorous derivation in a future video. So Joseph Fourier said that all two pi periodic functions can be decomposed or made up from sinusoids of varying frequencies. And we've seen that already. We looked at the square wave. And he said it using the equations which are written at the bottom of your screen. And something I'm sure you've seen in the past and I'm not going to really get bogged down in them now. Now we are able to extend from two pi periodic functions to periodic functions of 2L using this particular form of the Fourier series. That's that's nothing new I would hope. And as, as I've said num numerous occasions at this stage that if our function is uh, in the time domain, t is measured in seconds, then L is measured in per second or hertz. So we are going from the time domain to the frequency domain, or the length or position domain to the frequency domain. And just in case you're wondering how do we go between cos omega t to cos kx, well, I've written down the required uh, expressions for that. Note, by the way, we're getting back that the, it's, we're getting back that the, uh, the period is twice L, which is exactly what, what, I've, what, what I wanted it to be. But this is just a quick revision of Fourier series. It's not something I want to get bogged down in. 